before starting the session formally, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Trevor Lane. Uh, tr uh, Dr. Trevor Lane is a publishing and education consultant based in Hong Kong. He uh, did his PhD from uh, Oxford University and uh, he also uh, did his two postdocs in uh, various uh, uh, two postdocs and uh, in Hong Kong. He is also the editor and the managing editor of several uh, journals especially in medical sciences and also in uh, two social sciences journals as well in United States. Dr. Lane is a member of Royal Society of uh, Biology, World Association of Medical Editors, Institute of Scientific and Technical Communicators and uh, International Association of Teachers of English as Foreign Language. He holds his uh, certificate in uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages from uh, Trinity College London and uh, postgraduate certificate in English language teaching from University of Reading. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lane, for joining us uh, in this evening in Pakistan. And uh, we have uh, uh, 60 plus uh, participants who are uh, eager to hear from you on uh, the side topic. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, hand over the mic to you and uh, please start the session formally. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll share my screen. So thank you everyone for joining this webinar. And thank you for the invitation from UMT to COPE. And I'm very happy to be able to represent COPE and give this webinar about promoting integrity in scholarly research and publication. Now, some of you may have already heard of COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, uh, but in case some of you haven't, uh, or even if some of you have, but you haven't looked at our website for the past few years, then actually this is going to be an update of our latest resources. So COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, offers advice and resources and education to editors and publishers. And so this webinar is about our latest guidelines to help journal officers publish ethically and to maintain the integrity of the world's scholarly literature. So I hope some of you are editors and publishers, but also researchers and authors as well. So that there's a lot um, for different stakeholders to learn about. So there is a chat box and um, there will be a, a case discussion session. So I'm hoping it will be uh, interactive and that um, we can use the chat box. So here's a quick summary of my bio. You heard the introduction before. So I'm based in Hong Kong and my current affiliation is that I'm a research enhancement and development consultant at the City University of Hong Kong. And I've been on COPE Council for nearly seven years now. And last year I was elected a trustee. So I'm a trustee and a council member of COPE. I also do freelance consulting for Springer Nature and Asia Edit. So here's the agenda. To start, I'll be giving a quick introduction of COPE's work, just in case some of you are unfamiliar with COPE. There's our core practices, the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. And then I'll list some useful resources before the main part, which is the case workshop. And we'll hold a discussion workshop, although it's not really a discussion, I'll just be asking you to put in your votes in the chat box. And we will be using some real COPE cases, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session. 
So COPE is a UK-based nonprofit group that turned 25 years last year, so 25 years old, and it's run by a few paid staff and 40 or so volunteers who are trustees or council members. And COPE's 13,500 members, and I know UMT as a publisher is also a member, they come from nearly 100 countries. They're mostly journal editors, but also now universities and research institutes, as well as other individuals and companies, including author and journal support services. Now, we're not a regulatory or legal body, but the wide membership from around the world jointly promotes publication ethics worldwide through support and education and debate. And our mission, uh, the regular mission is on the my background um, about the integrity of the scholarly literature. But last year we had a special motto called creating a culture of publication integrity together. So the usual mission is promoting integrity in scholarly research and its publication. But the Jubilee, Silver Jubilee, our 25th anniversary, we had a, a new one creating a culture of publication integrity together because we opened our membership to institutions and universities for the first time because we rec recognize and realize that we need the researchers, the university research integrity officers, as well as the publishers and editors and journals to help maintain the integrity of the literature together. It's a joint effort. Now, as part of that joint effort and as inviting members of universities, so research integrity officers, ethics officers, they all have to uphold as members the COPE core practices. So there are 10 core practices and I'll they actually replaced, in 2017, they replaced what you might have seen, the COPE codes of conduct. So the point is that we don't have codes of conduct anymore because we're not that type of organization where the members have to follow rules and they're a member or not. Actually, we want it to be deeper. We want member journals and member universities to follow a culture and follow ethical behavior to create their own codes of conduct. So these 10 core practices on our website, uh, publicationethics.org, are just very high level umbrella guidelines to ask our members to please create and abide by your own ethical codes of conduct because all journals, uh, disciplines, universities in different countries will have different traditions. So we don't want to dictate um, like a set of rules, but you have to create your own rules. And these are the 10 core practices to create your own rules. So you might have seen on the left, uh, these old codes of conduct, these um, have been archived now. So they've been retired. And instead of codes of conduct, you have to create your own rules and regulations and guidelines following these 10 core practices. So this might be new to some of you. Uh, so do ask me questions later on. So the 10 core practices, I won't read it all out. It's on our website, publicationethics.org. So basically you need good policies and processes to deal with allegations of misconduct, for, for example, and also clear policies on authorship and contributorship that basically means non-author contributorship, who goes in the author's list, who goes in the acknowledgements list. There's also a need for handling complaints and appeals, and also conflicts of interest or competing interests of all parties, including authors, reviewers, editors, journals, and publishers. So being transparent and declaring conflicts of interest. Journals need policies on data availability and reproducibility, and of course, ethical oversight of the research and of publishing practices and of journal business practices. There's also intellectual property issues and the ethics of journal management and operations. Finally, journal policies are needed on peer review processes and post-publication 
discussions and corrections. And the core practices aren't recommendations just for COPE members, but for the academic publishing community worldwide. So these are on our website and it's meant for everyone to follow. Now, there's a second set of guidelines called the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. So those 10 core practices are also joined by these 16 principles of transparency. Now, you may have seen them, you may have not. Actually, this is the fourth version that was just issued last year, and it replaces version three from 2018. So this is version four already, and it's co-produced jointly by COPE, as well as DOAJ, you might have heard of, the Directory of Open Access Journals, OASPA, or Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association, and WAME, or WAMI, or the World Association of Medical Editors, that I'm also a member of. Now, I helped revise the third version in 2018. I wasn't involved in the fourth version. But again, if you haven't used these, please do, because it's part of the uh, screening criteria. It's not the only criteria, but it's part of the screening criteria for journals and publishers to join those organizations listed there. So again, I won't go through them all, it's on our website. So the revamp has put them into four different themes. So that's the main change. And there's um, new bullet points added. So there is a difference in the fourth version compared with the third version. So um, we expect journal websites to follow and give certain information. We expect um, evidence of these 16 principles, again, either in the operation of the journal and the website, in the content, so actual articles should have certain things on them and in them, the peer review process descriptions, everything like that. So the whole working of the journal should follow these principles and there should be evidence, there should be URLs and links of these specific policies and practices. So new members who try to join the those four organizations, or definitely for COPE, we would check the websites and check the journal content that they show signs and evidence of these 16 principles. Um, and if the of the existing members were asking them to please update your website and update your policies because there, there are some differences. So again, you'll have to study them and download from our website, but basically the four, uh, the four themes are uh, principles to do with journal content, journal practices, the organization itself of the journal and its management, and then business practices. And for example, keeping any um, financial operations separate from the editorial discussions. So the introduction is here. I've highlighted uh, a new paragraph which says editorial decisions should be based on scholarly merit and not on nationality, ethnicity, political beliefs, race, religion, and that the journal should regularly assess the policies for inclusivity. So make sure if you're uh, claiming that your journal is an international journal, then make sure that it has an international editorial board. For journal content, there's policies on the name of your journal, the what should be in the website for readers and authors and reviewers to see, a description of the journal, for, so a clear aims and scope, target readership, a clear publishing schedule that you have to adhere to, archiving plan for uh, permanent archiving in a registry like Locks or Clocks or PubMed Central, copyright policies and licensing policies, for example, open access, CC, Creative Commons. And then journal practices cover uh, publication ethics. So this is where there's, uh, there's overlap between the COPE core practices and these 16 principles. So our members have to follow both sets, but there is a harmony and integration because 
uh, principle number seven basically lists all of our cope core practices. And the only two which have been taken out separately are peer review, because that's the a principle on its own. So a clear model and uh, describe your processes, uh, train your reviewers to, to peer review ethically and be clear about your decision making and also actually we ask now for uh, member journals to put the dates of uh, submission, dates of acceptance on articles. There's also, so there's one more um, COPE core practice that uh, has been separated out of that list. So in that principle number seven, actually there's eight of our core practices. And then, as I said, the ninth one was peer review, which has been separated. And the 10th one is our core practice on journal management. And of course, journal management is a major part um, and it's most of these 16 principles. So it's been spread out throughout these 16. So there is harmony between the 10 COPE core practices and these 16 principles of transparency, which are basically how a journal should be run. Of course, COPE now, as I said, has um, not just journal members, but also we want a university and research institution members. So they wouldn't be following these 16 principles because this is specifically for journals. Uh, organization wise, there's principles on ownership and management being clear on who your editorial board are and uh, contact information as well. Then on the business side, of course, be clear on author fees if you charge uh, article processing fees or other revenue and how you go about your advertising and your marketing that you don't spam people uh, and Basically, these principles are what not to do to look like a predatory journal. So it's being a transparent, trustworthy journal. So those are the 16 principles. So please do have a look at them at our website, publicationethics.org, and try to adhere to them. You can quote them. Uh, you can transparently show that you're following each of the 16 things. So COPE members then uh, have the benefit of COPE activities and resources. So we have quarterly forums where our members uh, will bring anonymized ethics cases for discussion. Uh, that's for members only, but then there's over 600 documented forum cases that are archived on the website for the public to see and learn from. And usually those cases, because there are special cases, they form new guidelines and new flowcharts in the future. So usually the, for basic easy cases to solve ethical problems, there are some flowcharts, there's guidelines and guidance documents from COPE, and then if there are some new areas, we discuss them in forum and have discussion documents before it becomes uh, firmed into uh, flowcharts and policies. So of course, there's going to be new topics coming up. Uh, a new one now is going to be generative AI. How should authors, can you, authors use uh, generative AI chatbots to help them? We have webinars and uh, like this one. And then there are some special COPE seminars just for members. Uh, COPE, as I said, is a co-author of the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing, those 16 principles. And for members, we have an e-learning site and a journal audit tool for you to check that you're following our COPE core practices. So I just want to highlight some key guideline documents and also some new ones that have come up in the past one or two years that you might not be aware of if you are a COPE member. So we do have the latest retraction guidelines and we have a special guideline on uh, ethical peer review. So those are our popular and very important guidelines to uh, basically read through and follow from front to back page. There's also, so these are relatively new. So lots of people ask, can the journal office, um, are they allowed to edit what the peer reviewers say if the peer reviewers have said something wrong or bad or rude? So we have some guidelines on how to edit 
the reviews of peer reviewers before you release them to the authors. Of course, we're not asking you to censor everything, but sometimes you might have to uh, moderate the language or remove illegal type of language. There's also relatively recent guidelines on editorial board participation because uh, many members are worried that if it sounds good if you have one person um, as a chief editor of 20 journals, but actually is that possible? Is it realistic? Is it a conflict of interest? So actually we're saying please do not be a member or a chief editor of many, many journals. You can be on a few editorial boards, but actually practically you're going to be too busy and then you're going to have too many conflicts of interest trying to serve different journals, different, um, different groups, different societies. And it, it's actually kind of unhealthy within one discipline, especially specialty disciplines, if it's the same editor in chief controlling, uh, gatekeeping the academic content for the whole area, research area for the whole world. So that's not healthy. So we have new guidelines on editorial board participation. We have uh, for members or for potential members who want to improve their journal editorial offices and they're not yet members and they want to apply to COPE. Um, so we have a toolkit for what guidelines to follow. Basically, ex it explains the 10 COPE core practices and the 16 principles of transparency to help journals try to follow good ethics and prepare their membership for COPE. And for new editors, there's a short guide for ethical editing for new editors. There's relatively new or it's revised flowcharts on the systematic manipulation of the publication process. So some signs to look for in to in case some a group of authors is trying to cheat the peer review process or cheat the publication process just to get many papers published as possible. So there are some um, warning signals to look for and then how to deal with those sometimes mass, um, mass paper um, ethical breaches. So related to that, on this slide, you can see there's a document called Paper Mills. So COPE collaborated with the STM Association, which is a publisher's association, to do some research about these large scale multi-paper problems. Either it's the same author trying to publish and cheat in many journals, or it's a paper mill, like an essay mill helping students cheat. And they're writing papers for authors and then uh, trying to cheat the peer review system. So this is, again, a new topic and something to look out for. Um, from paper mill companies helping authors get published everywhere but they charge the authors sometimes the authors get cheated they didn't know or sometimes they ask the paper mill to cheat like an essay paper mill, essay mill uh, for students there are some guidelines by cope and force 11 on data publication policies so this is because it's now it's not too new it's been around about 10 years many journals many funders and many institutions want researchers to share data and share anonymized raw data sets because that's a public good and it's another research output and it helps people verify your research verify your findings uh, your calculations and to use the data in the future especially if they want to do a meta-analysis they need to pull the data from many um, articles on the same topic. So that means they do need the raw data. So many authors now need to upload their data as well onto repositories that comes with its own guidelines and problems. So there's a whole set of force 11 cope uh, policies on data publication. And similarly, uh, we do have a cope core practice about data availability and reproducibility. So this is where many journals now need to have a data policy and introduce a data availability statement. So PNAS has this statement and it actually, or in its um, guidelines, so it actually says you, you have to share your data. So some journals make it a requirement that you have to share your raw data underlying the conclusions or the figures, illustrations and tables. And some journals um, have a 
gradation of uh, requirements. So the next slide is from Nature Portfolio. Of course, they have many journals and they here have four types of journal depending on how strong their data policy is. So some of the Nature journals want uh, authors they, they have to share the data. Some just encourage the authors to share the data. Um, but most, I would say, most journals internationally now should be having a data availability statement. So even if they don't say it's a requirement to share your data set, you at least have to have a statement either in the methods or at the end in the declarations. How can the readers get hold of the data? If the authors are transparent and they've uploaded everything to a repository then they can put the link there and people can freely uh, obtain that data to verify it to check it against the results and conclusions of the paper or to even uh, have onward use of it and do a meta analysis if it's not in a repository you have to explain how can the reader get hold of that data do they contact the corresponding author do they need to write and give ask for special permission? Uh, does that have to go through an ethics board approval process itself? So this is the data availability statement. Linked to that is how do you upload data? There are now some fair guidelines or fair principles. Again, these are now international guidelines to try to get institutions and authors to understand making their data sets findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So that's fair. So I've put the links there. And um, um, maybe I will contact the organizer and give you the PDF of these slides because then the links will be active. You can actually press on the links in the PDF. And here is a link for a data repository website that will help people identify which is the best website to upload their data to. So some data, uh, there are some special websites, for example, for DNA sequences, protein sequences, chemical uh, formulae, chemical structures. So some disciplines have special subject repositories, otherwise there are some general ones. Um, I can think of Figshare, Dryad, Zenodo, even some universities have their own public repositories. So it's got to be public and free for people to download the data. So um, uh, this website, r3data.org, lists all of those. And then there's something called the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines. So this is something that, um, again, worldwide is uh, being promoted. So of course, uh, the United Nations is promoting open science, open research, open data. So basically, how open are journals? How transparent are they in, for example, requiring data sharing, or at least uh, encouraging data sharing, or having a data availability statement? And I've put here the Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. So for, of course, clinical trials, for human clinical trials, we have to pre-register the trials before the actual study. And so there's the WHO approved websites, there's clinicaltrials.org, and then there's a link here for Pakistan's clinical trial registry. So that's called pre-registration. Again, to try to be transparent and show what the protocol is and the statistical and data management plan before the authors start doing the study, because it's too tempting, it's too easy to cheat and change the protocol, change your statistics, change the outcome variables that you're looking at. And linked with that is something called registered reports, which you may not have heard of. So this is a new thing that many journals are starting, where they will accept, um, in principle, the protocol of a paper before it, the study starts. And then if you've done sound science, you follow the protocol, you didn't cheat or change the statistical tests or change the variables. If you submit it to that same journal, they will promise to accept the paper. Of course, it's got to go through peer review and still be high quality, but basically they don't care if your results are positive or negative or whatever, because again, the, the false, um, uh, pressure to only publish positive results is going to skew the integrity of the scholarly record. So registered reports um, helps uh, detect any cheating, but also wants the um, authors to publish the protocol first, or at least have it peer reviewed first, and then they can confidently publish the results, no matter if they're positive 
or negative. So they don't have to be, um, they don't have to always uh, fulfill their hypothesis and prove their hypothesis all the time. We do need the balanced, unbiased, objective scholarly record. So that's called registered reports. And then finally, there's credit, the cred uh, contributor roles taxonomy. So many journals now want authors to actually list their contributions and also for people who are not authors again be transparent and acknowledge how did they contribute to the paper but they were not authors and then of course ORCID stands for open research and contributor ID which is like an ID number for all researchers so that they keep the same um, ID number no matter if their names change format in different journals so it's like a, an online CV for researchers but again to be transparent but also log other academic contributions, including peer review contributions, because we want to credit peer review um, activity and encourage more people to peer review. And that's important in careers as well. So ORCID is becoming more important as well. And finally, there's the equator network. So for social sciences and clinical studies, anything to do with humans, uh, but there's also animals as well. Uh, the Equator Network has international guidelines for reporting your work like a checklist. So again, it's complete and objective and unbiased so that we have your complete um, articles online. It's reproducible and we know what you did in the study. So it's very easy to forget something. So if you follow the, the guidelines, follow the checklists, uh, they're all there on Equator Network. There's hundreds of these guidelines. You have to write, find the right uh, guideline for the study type, whether it's qualitative, social sciences, animal experiments, human randomized control trial, observational studies. So there's a flowchart there, or there's, there is a site that helps you find the right uh, guideline for the study type. Uh, so many journals insist on um, using these as well to make sure the studies are complete. Okay, so now we can move on to the case workshop. I hope that was a quick, useful tour of some of the latest guidelines and developments in scholarly publishing. So I'm hoping that uh, if you run a journal or run an editorial office, you do keep updated. This is the, um, we've just gone through Chinese New Year here in Hong Kong. So it's time for spring cleaning. So spring clean your journal office and do update all your guidelines for the COPE core practices, the latest 16 principles of transparency and those resources that I've just pointed out. Okay, so before we move on, I'll check that I can activate the chat box. Okay. Um, so I might ask, answer some of the questions now. Um, or maybe I'll scroll back up to answer because these are quite long questions. Okay, so the chat box is working. So if you have the chat box, I'll be able to scroll back up. So don't worry if you asked a question already. Um, and then we'll keep the end for questions. Um, so if I ask you to put in a number, basically it's multiple choice. And so let's have a go at five cases based on real COPE forum cases of some ethical problems that might come up in your journal office. So the first one is that a publisher noticed that an accepted economics paper was also on a website as a discussion paper or working paper. So uh, the publisher asked the author to remove the online version and because the journal policy is that the journal has the right of first publication. So this is at an acceptance stage. So it's before publication, the journal accepted the paper, but found a version of it on a discussion paper web website. So of course, if, if you're social sciences or if you do economics, there's, um, you'll know of the social sciences um, uh, working paper or discussion paper sites. There's SSRN, there's Social Archive. Um, so the question is, was the action appropriate that the publisher asked the author to remove the online discussion paper? So the options are one, yes, because working papers count as already formally published. 
and journals have the right of the first publication. So the journal wants to be the original first publisher, so the author should take down the discussion paper. Or two, no, it wasn't appropriate, because even though, uh, because working papers count as formally published, the journal should reject the paper, so they should de-accept it. And I've underlined journal editor because it should be the journal editor telling the author um, whether to take something down or not. It shouldn't really be the publisher. They can ask the publisher for advice, but the um, well, only in extreme cases, the publisher directly contacts the author, but usually it's the journal editor. So in this case, um, the journal editor thinks the working paper, again, was formally published, so shouldn't be in a journal, so they reject it. Or three, um, the opposite, working papers don't count as published yet, so that was the wrong action to take. The publisher shouldn't have asked the author to take it down because uh, discussion papers are not yet published. So what do you think? So please type in the chat box one, two or three. If you have quick fingers, you can type a quick reason as well. Um, so I've have, there's a few ones already. So I'll give you a few more seconds. Yes, there's a two. Any more? Any more bids? So there's a few twos now, but most people put one. Maybe there's two thirds is one and one third is two. And we have a three as well. So yeah, these are tricky. So we'll see as we go along. So let's have a look. So there's a mixture now. So there's some people have put one, some have put two, some have put three. So I've put a note that it could be two or three um, because it depends on the journal policy. Do they think online working papers or discussion papers, which usually are not finalized, they get revised. It's like a draft, an online draft for usually academic use and academic discussion. Some journals regard that as already published and some regard it as not already published. So the journal editor could have rejected it or um, they could have continued with the peer review or in this case it got accepted. So it's okay for publishing, but maybe you have to say this has already appeared as a working paper. So I didn't um, think one is a good option because first of all, it depends on the journal policy, whether working papers are published or not. But journals don't really have the right of first publication unless they say it and there's an agreement like the copyright transfer agreement. So unless you're quite strict and you that's a condition of publication and you don't allow anywhere else including blogs or social media or preprints then you have to state it to the author and as we saw in the 16 principles you have to state it on your website as part of your conditions so there are no fixed rules the thing is that you just have to be transparent. So some journals, yes, might say you, they have the right for first publication and they can be quite strict and say so you can't have it appear here or there or there. So one is quite strict, but it's not an automatic universal rule that journals are the first place to publish things. Uh, if it is, then say it in your guidelines. So it could be two or three. So for the conclusion of this case, and this is what the um, what happened in the forum case. So it's on the summary on our COPE website. So um, the answer is it depends on journal policy and whatever journals say um, or they decide that a discussion paper is published or not, then be transparent about it. So the new policy of that journal now so in the past, they didn't have a clear policy, so they revised their policy. This is just in that case, so you, you don't have to follow this. You need your own policy. So they revised their policy to say the publisher doesn't consider a working paper as prior publication, nor would the existence of a working paper online disqualify an article from being submitted. And the publisher would not expect a working paper to be removed from the server or a conference website if the author declares to the journal editor on submission 
that the article is based on the working paper, which is already online. It's expected that the submitted article is substantially developed from the working paper. So this is not necessary, but if you have it as your guideline, then um, be clear and expect, um, say that you expect 50% as original or 30% more discussion or something like that. So in this case, they want some development of the working paper. It's not always the case. Also, any working paper must be fully referenced in the submitted article. And the author should not assign copyright when uploading to a, a discussion paper site or preprint server. So that's legal. So you shouldn't have given away your copyright. Otherwise, it's still possible, but then you need copyright permission. So I've put here some extra notes. So these might have been, this is um, uh, an old case. So since then, we now know there's preprint servers. There's working papers, there's conference reports. So whether the journal regards those as prior publications, uh, we call it the published version of record. Is it the final published version? If not, then say in your guidelines what, uh, what can you consider as a submission. Clearly mark the preprint or the discussion version as not peer reviewed. And then when it does get published in the journal, link it back and have the URL of the final journal version of record and many preprint servers or discussion papers sites don't allow you to put the publisher version online because that's the publisher version you just link the preprint or link the discussion paper to the final site and if you if you're one of your journals has this policy well whether it's one way or the other so if if you accept submissions that have already been preprints, discussion papers, uh, conference papers. There's a site called Sherpa Romeo or Sherpa Romeo. So if you're in charge of a journal or editorial office, please up upload your journal information to Sherpa Romeo. It's like a database of different policies because as we see, as we saw, they can vary. So then authors can click and find your guidelines find your policy. Do you accept preprints? Do you accept um, discussion papers as new submissions? So uh, different journals have different policies. There's a whole mixture of them there. So do look up Sherpa Romeo or register with Sherpa Romeo. Um, so before the questions scroll up, because we're going to have more multiple choice, um, someone's asked is it possible that a paper uh, something an article a paper can be removed from a website so this is in general so it's not i'm not answering whether it's the journal website or whether it is a preprint website or the working paper website so we saw in the case before that the publisher wanted to remove the paper so any removal whether it's a journal or preprint site um, it is possible but that there has to be special reasons. So there could be an ethical reason, breach of confidentiality, it's got data from patients with their identities, or there's a legal reason, or there's a, um, like a intellectual property reason. So uh, maybe your work was funded or sponsored, but the small print of the sponsor um, conditions said, oh, you, you can't publish this or this because it's like coca-cola or something it has a the recipe of coca-cola that you put online so sometimes there are some legal reasons you shouldn't have done that then they remove the um whether it's a preprint or a paper and there will be what's called a tombstone web page saying this paper was here but has been removed uh, so it has to be from some special cases but the record the metadata don't get removed but the um the, the actual paper gets removed. That's quite rare. Usually, as we say, if there's a problem, there's a correction, there's a retraction, everything stays there with a note saying what is the up to date version. So retractions still stay there. You don't actually remove it unless there's a clear ethical privacy legal reason. So it is possible to, to really remove something. Okay, so the next case is this one a reader wrote to the editor claiming authorship of a published article so it's already been published and then the reader says i should have been an author because i contributed 50 percent more than 50 percent of the cases in the study 
It could be business case, it could be case reports of uh, patients. The editor asked the listed authors for more information. So that's the case. So the question is, what further action should the editor take? Number one, publish an expression of concern. So this is warning readers that there's an unresolved disputed authorship case. The authors um, have an argument and I haven't resolved it yet, uh, but this is like a advance warning for readers. There might be a problem with this paper. Number two, retract the article because this is clearly author misconduct that uh, they've omitted one of the authors who contributed some material. Or three, retract the article because the authors have actually committed a crime and they've stolen the data and used it without permission from that reader. So those are the three uh, alternatives in this case. So number one, uh, warn that there's an authorship problem. Number two, retract because of author misconduct. Or three, retract because the data was stolen. So immediately there's lots of ones. There's a two, there's a three. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, there's another three. Okay, so let's have a look. So I've indicated one is possible, but now in the left-hand column, it says the, the editor asked the authors to explain. So of course, if they've written to the authors and emailed them and asked them for an explanation, that means you have to wait for them to actually re reply and respond. So you would re wait for the authors to give an explanation only if they can't resolve the case and can't explain it, then you can put a warning, but you wouldn't retract it because the at the moment, the conclusions are still sound. But if you want to say, oh, there's a con contested authorship issue, uh, only if the authors can't resolve it, then you might put a, a notice there. You wouldn't retract yet at this point because you haven't proven author misconduct. So technically, the editor only asked the authors to explain. That's where they. That's where the process stopped. So they haven't proven misconduct yet. And number three, technically, is too early. Uh, you haven't proven it's data fraud or stolen data. So one is possible only at the right stage if the authors hadn't resolved the issue. So two and three are a bit too early. So I know some editors are quite stringent and they'll just, um, the thing is they try to punish the authors. So Cope's um, stance is that you don't use retractions as punishment or anything like that. Use this as a, um, a chance to teach and to inform the, if anything, inform the institution and they have to resolve the problem or they, they are the ones who employ the author so they can punish the author. But um, Cope is more interested in correcting the scholarly record. So at this point, we don't know whether the scholarly record is wrong yet. So the next slide shows the actual advice from Cope Forum to... Me, uh, yes. Uh, one of the live case which uh, we recently observed uh, is the example which you have uh, mentioned just now. Uh, the case is that uh, one of the author, corresponding author, along with other authors, submitted uh, an, an article to a journal and the uh, journal published the article. And uh, when it was published, it was basically retrieved or you can say uh, uh, derived from a thesis of a student. When the article was published, the student launched a complaint about the, the authorship issue. And uh, 
all the authors which were uh, originally mentioned in the article were not the part of the thesis. And now the typical problem is that uh, the original student whose thesis was uh, stolen from somewhere, he didn't want to publish this article in the, this journal especially. What we should do now in this case? Please guide us. Uh, so that's slightly different because uh, that's um, is different, but I wouldn't say common, but it is something that happens because of how students, student theses, and I would uh, I would say supervisors or co-authors how it works. So I, I'm not sure in your case. I can't advise in your case because I don't know who the um, because you should be following um, one of the flow charts. So if there's uh, an ethical problem, basically you go to the author and you go to the institution. So I don't know whether the the authors who stole the thesis material, whether they are the supervisor. That's what I said is um, not common, but that's known because it's the, the usual supervisor a student conflict or whether it's more sinister he, and so he, it's another group another group but that's not for us to discuss now you have to um it doesn't matter really who that group is of course it's fraudulent if it's if it's a supervisor student kind of case then it should go to the institution and the institution will follow up but then basically you have um if whatever the student proves if you have the evidence from the student and the institution then you follow up with um uh, should we uh, withdraw the paper or retract the person uh, who published persons who published with their name was not supervisor they were some other persons and should we retract the paper or we should withdraw the paper because the original uh, person who is having intellectual property rights do not want to publish it with this journal especially. So this touches on the case before. It might have been you who wrote in the chat. So someone wrote, can you ever, ta can you ever take down a paper? And I said, as one of the conditions that if you have a legal reason, I use the reason of Coca-Cola, um, that if you put something that shouldn't have been some intellectual property that shouldn't have been put up there. So if it's an intellectual property case, then again, it's up to your um, investigation committee to decide what has actually happened. So um, it could have been a student supervisor case or as you're saying um, it's not the supervisor then you have to follow um, your own procedure for how to deal with intellectual property cases uh, you should have an in-house lawyer um, and then you follow the procedure for that uh, we uh, sent the case to our university's uh, publication ethics committee and the uh, committee, it was proved that uh, the persons who have published student thesis with their name was uh, ghost authors, you can say. But the uh, problem is that should we retract the paper from the journal or we should withdraw the paper? This is the problem which we are uh, in problem to decide. Um, this is... I. The thing is, um, I think COPE received a case similar, so you should have, um, if it actually came from you, you should have the response from COPE. I wouldn't use this workshop as uh, to discuss that case. So please either, you can bring it to COPE and discuss anonymously um, if you're a if COPE member, but we, we, we can't really discuss this case further. But I've told you the principles that it's either a supervisor student um, issue that has to be resolved by the university and in that case sometimes the student and supervisor they have a change of heart or they 
cooperate and either just correct the paper, but they realize, oh, it's, it's okay. Sometimes we have cases like this and the student um, realize, oh, doesn't matter. Maybe they, they've moved on or maybe they thought actually the, the paper's fine and they would have, they, they, they wrote half of it anyway or something. And therefore they just add, add the name back to the paper and have a correction. So there's different things you can do if it was a supervisor student argument and then they can resolve it that way or they can uh, retract it and publish somewhere else but then um, uh, that's a student supervisor case if it was fraudulent or stolen property then i would talk to your lawyers and have uh, have a policy in place that you can use but i wouldn't discuss this any further please bring your case to cope or i think you maybe already have brought the case to cope okay so um, moving on on this case uh, so this is slightly different where the reader has um, uh, recognized some of his or her own data. So 50% of the cases were in the paper and they think they should be an author. So in this case, I said, um, you can't be too harsh and retract it yet. You haven't proven anything yet. So you could put an expression of concern saying that there's a dispute if the authors haven't resolved it. Uh, in this case, the COPE Forum advised that uh, the journal, first of all, should be clear in its guidelines uh, what is an author, so what are the roles and criteria for authorship, and then explain to all parties so that they can decide, um, especially with the authors themselves as well, did that reader do enough to fulfill authorship criteria? Is just given 50% of the cases enough to be an author. Maybe they helped them um, get the data, but then they didn't do anything else. So they didn't analyze or interpret or write the paper. So according to um, the ICMJE, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors guidelines, that wouldn't be enough to be an author because you just helped with data collection. That's, that's not enough. So that means that the journal has to be clear what are the criteria ask the authors to resolve and if the authors can't resolve uh, you can put an expression of concern in the paper but you definitely go to the institution and the institution has to investigate and give a resolution on who is an author or not so there is um, a flow chart on how to add an author after publication if you really need to follow that but as a follow-up note so yes you could need to put a correction notice to add that author back or if they didn't do enough as an author you add their name as an acknowledgement or and definitely explain more about the data source and where it came from and in the future it's best to declare or ask the authors to declare uh, who is an author but who contributed but who is not an author so you're asking your authors to declare that all the authors in the paper are correct and they haven't omitted anyone who is an author and the acknowledgements list is also correct and also they have permission from people to thank them in the acknowledgements. Also ask the authors to declare where the data come from and do they have consent to use and publish and share the data and as I, as I showed you before, it's best practice now to have data availability statements. So are the data also available online afterwards? And in that case, again, you have to be clear, do you have permission to share that data? Where did they come from? So be more clear on where the data come from and then and who is the author, and then that should help reduce this type of case in the future. So case number three, is so someone's put um, they think three applies because it was stolen not really because if it's uh authors who have fallen out with each other or they lost contact and they couldn't find that reader they couldn't find the other author who gave them the data so it's not stolen it's just misunderstanding or they just forgot to thank them and they can come up with an agreement that they get thanked in the acknowledgements, or if they had done enough, they helped write the paper and they forgot to put them down as an author, then they can thank the, um, then they can put the author down as a 
um, in the author list. So it's not proven that it's stolen. You need the institution to help. Usually the, the um, authors will be employed by the institution and the institution has its own guidelines and rules on who owns the data, how the data should be shared amongst authors, things like that. So it's very difficult to, to prove it has been stolen unless you have an investigation. So the editor can't do that on his or her own without the investigation. So number three is that there's a corresponding author who asked the editor to retract a publishing pa uh, published paper because the first author in the paper First, it's based on a thesis, and it did get permission from the student, but the first author added extra data from the same database. But the corresponding author doesn't like this, so they initiated their own investigation at their institution, and they still wanted a retraction. So who, who was right, the first author or the corresponding author? So the question is, what should the editor do next? Number one, retract the article because there's data fabrication, there's extra data. Number two, publish an expression of concern that there's an institutional investigation going on because the corresponding author initiated it. Or number three, ask the complainant, the corresponding author, to formally write down what the problem is, because at the moment it's only between the journal and the corresponding author write it down so that the other authors can comment and try to explain where the data come from. So in this case, again, it's one, two, or three. Someone's asked, can a non-COPE member ask COPE? No, so you have, this is one of the um, benefits of being a COPE member. So only COPE members can um, bring a case to forum like this and discuss a case and, and get advice from the other members and the, the council members who attend forum. So um, most people have written three. Some people, someone's written a two. So most people have written three. And in this case, you're right, I remember, yes. Three is the best. Um, again, we've seen the, a pattern. The pattern is get an explanation first. So ask the authors to try to resolve it amongst themselves. So um, this is similar to the case before, like where did the data come from? So the authors have to agree. Of course, you expect they should have known where the data come from before, but you ask them to sort it out themselves. The journal itself cannot do that investigation. You can't prove it's stolen. You can't prove um, um, things like that. You need the authors to sort it out. So number three is the best answer in that case. Um, let's have a look at the other ones. So number one, retract for data fabrication. Again, you haven't proven the first author made up the data. If there's an investigation, yes, it, it did come from a database. It maybe just needs better explanation. Number two, publish an expression of concern about the institutional investigation. So in this case, again, technically, the journal didn't ask for the investigation. So just because the corresponding author said, maybe out of anger or annoyance, oh, I've initiated an investigation, uh, the journal has to confirm that and initiate their own investigation and correspondence with the institution. And only if the institution isn't helpful or it's taking a long time, then you, and it's not resolved, then you can put an expression of concern there. So again, you have to wait for the process to play out first. So number one and number two are too early to do those. So the follow up here. So there's a COPE flowchart on fabricated data in the published article. So again, you follow the steps. And again, an early step would probably be do contact the, the authors to find out what happened. So in this case, um, the journal did ask the institution to investigate properly. And then they asked the institution to, when they conclude, please give an investigation report, tell us what your um, verdict is, and then they can decide if they've uh, to do a correction or retraction or whatever based on the actual investigation result. But in this case, actually, the institution 
didn't reply back. And then the complainant, the um, corresponding author, also didn't reply back. So they changed their mind. So in this case, the case just ended itself. There was no retraction. The case was closed. So in this case, it just stopped. So usually, though, following the flowchart, you would go through the institutional investigation. So the follow-up notes I've added is that you ask the authors to settle it first, then involve the institution. Uh, then you might have to publish a correction explaining the data source and that there were extra data added on top of the student data. Or if it's proven that there was a data problem and the author didn't have permission to use the data, something like that, you might have to retract or give an expression of concern if there was no resolution or investigation is pending. And in the future, to try to avoid this type of problem, ask for declarations on authorship and non-authorship, uh, non-author contributorship, same as before. Ask for full details of where the data come from and again, ask for a data availability statement. Check for declarations of permission and consent to use the data, publish and share the data. Again, where did it come from? And then some journals do this. Um, they either are very strict and they ask all authors to sign that they all had access to all the data. That makes sure that they all know where the data come from. They all analyzed it and they all, they all touched the data, they all saw the data. Some journals don't say all, they say one or two uh, of the authors. So the corresponding author plus another one, or they might call a guarantor. One of the author group has to be the guarantor and be a witness that they saw the data, they touched the data. So having a data access declaration also will help to, solve, to avoid future cases like this. Of course, it's best for the journal to, uh, it's only a declaration, they can't themselves check all the raw data, um, but it's, it's another step to try to get authors to behave and say, yes, um, we know where the data come from. In the fourth case, so a journal rejected a submitted paper because two thirds had a text match. So we know the famous text matching software, uh, so I had an online report with the text match that the papers um, has a lot of overlap. The author appealed the rejection saying that actually the text match is because the funding agency, so it could be a private funder, could be government funder, as part of their requirements, asked for a copy of a draft manuscript, and then they uploaded it online without the author's permission. So that means it, it got published and it's online. The um, text matching software found it and found two thirds of a match. What should the editor do? Number one, treat the online report as an unpublished version, like an online PhD thesis or preprint and continue to peer review the paper. Number two, treat the online report as prior publication. So that means the paper remains rejected. It's already been published by accident. Or number three, treat the case as self-plagiarism because it's already been put online and they're trying to publish it again. Then the authors are committing self-plagiarism and misconduct. So treat it harshly like that and also um, report it to the funder. So those are the options in this case, one, two or three. Okay, so we have some early voters. Some people have put one, there's a two. There are some more twos. So between one and two. So let's have a look. So similar to the first case, one or two, so most people, oh, there's a three as well. So um, it's between one or two, it depends on journal policy. So if you decided that online reports are treated as published or not, then uh, declare this in your guidelines and treat it in the appropriate way. Uh, now in this case though, is the government version or the funder version, is it a preprint? 
Is it the actual manuscript itself? Is it is it just a public report? So sometimes the the government asks for an interim report or an end of project report, but it's it's only a summary. In this case, though, there's two thirds of text match, so it does look like the funder has a strange policy of putting the actual manuscript online, which is a bit too early. So in this case, the the funder has done something a bit odd. It wouldn't be number three. So again, it's I think it's the funder's policy that's strange. It's not the author's fault that the two thirds of the manuscript has appeared too early. So the, the funder might have misinterpreted something or put it up online thinking it was the summary report, or maybe they're thinking that, oh, we now produce preprints. So the funder has done something strange in this case. So it's between one and two. The relevant flowchart is redundant duplicate publication in a submitted manuscript. So I've put a link there to the flowchart. And the advice from forum was, again, what counts as pre-publication, like preprints or theses or conference papers that depends on journal policy. If in this case, the policy allows publication as in addition to the um, funder site, then again, do things like checking copyright permission, be transparent and declare that the, the paper is already online and in a preview or preprint or working paper version. So you have to state it at the time of submission and in the actual journal paper for readers to also know. And then maybe discuss with the funder what their policy is and why why did they prematurely publish a manuscript? So in the future, could there be an embargo? Could the funder not publish until the journal published? Uh, could you agree to do a simultaneous publication of the same paper or a different version of it, but you publish it together, the funder and the journal? Or educate the funder that there are there is such a thing as preprint now. So either ask the authors to upload it as a preprint on a preprint server but not the funder site so the funder site is not a preprint server and then you might have jeopardized the author's chances of publishing in the future so in this case the funder has done something weird uh, but it is possible to discuss and come to an agreement or ask the funder to clarify the policy in the future because it will happen again because that funder will be funding other research that the journal will want to publish so there's some confusion here. So the um, follow-up note I've added is that, again, journals have to declare what they, uh, their guidelines on what is original, what's originality, uh, what is pre-publication, and then ask authors or demand authors to be transparent and to say whether something has appeared somewhere else, either as a preprint or something else, and to cite it in the actual paper and then require authors to declare oh so many journals do this they require authors to declare similar work and even to give copies of works in submission elsewhere or already published so that the journal office can check there's no redundancy and no duplicate publication um, most journals allow theses summary reports for funders and then we saw before i said clinicaltrials.gov and pre-registration sites where you have to upload your protocol that's not counted as publication also conference abstracts usually are safe the gray area is conference papers conference summaries and reports and extended abstracts so anything which is a longer report in a conference might be looking too much like the final paper so in that case some journals might say you have to add 50 percent more work um, you need copyright permission uh, you need permission from the conference um, again the journal has to decide their policy now theses uh, if journals decide that a phd theses don't count as prior publication so it um, as long as this student has agreed um, with the supervisor how to publish it, uh, those can be published properly in a journal. But do note that some universities have something called degree by publication or thesis by publication. So some of the work in the thesis is already published and they have permission to 
summarize it or use it again in the actual thesis, or uh, there's overlap. So some of the work in the thesis is getting published or they're reworking it within the thesis, but some of them, some universities literally are just collections. The thesis is a collection of papers with some added commentary of the papers. So there's different types of already published work inside a thesis. So that's the other way around. So in that case, some of the thesis has already been published. So you, then the journal, another journal can't publish that again, because it's already the property of an earlier journal. So do, do be careful of the distinction between completely original theses and thesis or degree by publication. So some of that would already be copyrighted. Okay, so the last case, uh, a journal sent a paper to a reviewer who recognized, so um, again, it's another PhD case. Uh, the reviewer was the supervisor and recognized that it was their student's work and didn't put the supervisor's name as an author. So uh, the reviewer is claiming plagiarism and uh, asked, uh, and so the journal asked the author to explain and also referred the case to the institution. So this is one of those classic supervisor student um, arguments. So in this case, what should the uh, what else should the editor do? Number one, add the reviewer as an author and then send the paper to another peer reviewer because this is still the peer review stage. Or number two, just disqualify that reviewer for now because there's a conflict of interest. They were the supervisor and then find another peer reviewer. Or number three, reject the paper because it's another one of these dispute cases. So in this case, is it one, two, or three? So very quickly, some people have put two, someone's put one, there's also three. And another three, okay. So again, a mixture. So yeah, these are quite tricky. So in this case, again, the better answer, oh, surprise, surprise. So in this case, all three are possible, but it depends on the investigation outcome. So the editor can't do anything yet, it's too early. So you have to wait for the investigation to go on at the institution. And in this case, the journal did ask the institution, so they've launched the investigation themselves. They just have to be patient and wait for the outcome before choosing one, two, or three. So all three are possible, but the timing is the problem. So the relevant flow, COPE flowchart is plagiarism in a submitted manuscript. And the advice from forum and the conclusion are that uh, the forum said, wait for the institution's judgment. And then as happens, the reviewer, which was the supervisor, later backed down about the claim about plagiarism. And so the journal continued with peer review, but independent of that supervisor and uh, continued with the peer review process. So maybe in that case, the supervisor um, was being a bit too greedy. Maybe the student had done extra work. That part was not the supervised work or the supervisor hadn't done enough for that part. So again, the institution had to come in and help and work out who is an author, who is not an author. So just being a supervisor is not going to be enough. So this is very, I wouldn't say common, but it's very typical in a university setting. So the notes here are to hold off on the peer review, wait until the case is resolved before continuing peer reviewer, uh, peer review, and then seek another peer reviewer. The journal should have clear policies on what is self-plagiarism and plagiarism. Uh, how to handle theses and also um, peer review ethics and peer reviewer conflicts of interest in general. And then when the journal contacts the institution, hopefully they'll learn from each other and the institution would know they also need clear policies on how to publish from theses, give advice to the students, give advice to supervisors, uh, be careful of supervisor roles and be very clear on ghost guest gift authorship. So ghost authorship is missing out someone who was an author and guest and gift authorship are naming people who didn't do the work as authors. So universities um, have to educate their members to um, be ethical authors. So those are the, those are the cases and I'll 
now invite questions. So please type questions and I'll also go back to the, to the start to look for questions. Uh, so a question here is, does COPE provide consultation to journals? Again, only if they are a member and you bring cases to forum like this um, or in between forums, you can also contact COPE and ask for um, help. And if COPE counsel help, again, a condition is that we try to educate other members, but also educate non-members. So all the cases will get documented and archived anonymously in the website. Um, I'm not sure of this question that says, are the 16 principles of practice enough for the scanning of content? Um, I don't know if that means cope scanning to look for members, whether they are ethical or not, or whether it means the journals scan content that it's ethical. Um, of course, journal content has to be ethical. Um, someone's written, do we consider peer review as the process of writing or judge Judgment, judgment of transparency. Um, well, peer review is not the writing process, it's the peer review process of the submitted papers. So the, the process of peer review has to be transparent. Oh, I see what you mean. Is the, is the peer review report, does it have to be transparent, published online? Some journals use this, they call it open review or opened review. So even if you have a confidential process, they'll publish the peer review reports online. That's why we said sometimes you have to edit them a bit because they're not <laughs> meant to be public. Uh, so you can make them public and show, and actually it's, it's probably the best case, you can prove that the peer review process is ethical. Um, so you either choose to put them online as you go along and have the whole peer review process open, or you do it afterwards and you put the peer review reports online for everyone to see with or without the peer reviewer names. That's something different. So it, you can choose whether to credit the peer reviewer, uh, sometimes with the peer reviewer's permission. So whether there's the peer reviewer name or not is different, but the peer review report, you could put that online to be transparent and prove your processes. Otherwise, everything is behind closed doors. You, you cannot really tell if a peer review process is good or not. So that would be the most transparent way to judge peer review transparency. Uh, Dr. Lin, you can uh, see the questions by yourself because you are having the rights of... Uh... Yes, I'm scrolling down. So I think I've handled the earlier questions. Apologies if you asked a question before we did the voting. Um, so some of them I don't quite um, understand to, to answer. So hopefully I've answered the ones that can be answered. Um, and then I'm scrolling to after the voting. So new questions now. Um, can so someone asked this before so can how do journals get cope council help so yeah you have to be a member so you have to join cope to be able to get cope council advice or to present a case uh to cope forum the quarterly online meetings so you have to register with cope first so that means go online check our submission requirements go to the toolkit to kind of audit your own office to prepare it and um, have it ethical before you apply. So yeah, you do have to join as a member to get COPE help. Otherwise, there's many resources that are free if you don't need a specific case um, uh, advice for a case. There's all that um, material guidelines and flowcharts for non-COPE members to use. Does COPE have a policy uh, regarding inflating publication fees, APCs, so um, article processing charges, uh, so the author charges for having open access papers. So um, 
Pope does not have uh, does not fix the prices. We, so just like anything else um, that has a price, you get what you pay for. Uh, do your research, buyer beware, have a look at what is expensive or not, what you can afford or not. Um, is it realistic? Um, is there a reason? Can you um, to go to that journal? Uh, can you get help? Can your institution help? Can you ask for a, a waiver or a discount? So the actual price uh, point, we don't have a say. Um, each journal decides and will have to justify themselves why they're charging so much. Um, and whether you do charge or not, again, we don't say because each journal has a different business policy. So many um, universities um, will fund their own journals and I, I think UMT also, uh, authors don't pay. Um, and so you either have, there's a sponsor, a charity, a university, a funder, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whatever. So uh, it's not always the case that there's an APC. But the, the amount of it, that will just be dictated by market practices and uh, how fair it is. If it's a journal setting their APC, then again, you can um, do your own economic calculations or look for similar journal sizes and journal audiences that you can compare with to set an APC. Um, but again, it, it's not a necessity or a requirement to have APCs. Is there a fee to get registration done? So to register with COPE, um, there is a fee. Um, and it, if it's by publisher, then it's like any company. So it's like company size. So publisher size will determine the fee. Otherwise, um, journals can also apply separately. And again, you can ask for discounts and waivers. So the, the registration fee or membership fee shouldn't be a barrier. Um, it's just to, um, we have paid staff, so we have a handful of, per, uh, well, not permanent, but we have some some paid staff, so it goes towards that. We are a non-profit charity, so it's not, it's not a money-making um, venture, and any um, surplus goes back into education and support. Okay, thank you. Some people are thanking for the session, so um, thank you for the comments. So any other questions? Can a single person be registered? Yes, um, I think I actually am an individual member because uh, I've changed jobs so much. And also I was a consultant over the COVID years as well. So I, I've joined as an individual member. So uh, publishers, universities now, uh, that's different from university presses. So the um, treated as publishers, but also individuals and companies that help authors or provide author services or have an interest or do research in ethics. So any worthy um, individuals can apply and then you just fill in the form to explain um, are you, do you provide editorial services? Do you help with ethics? Do you, do you teach authors? Um, so all of those reasons are possible reasons to be an individual member. And again, there will be individual fees. I think it's, it's not that much. It's only a few tens, it's like 50 pounds or something. Um, uh, yes, okay. so any more questions? Any more question from the audience who have joined us uh, online? I think many of the questions have been addressed. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lane, for giving us the time uh, for this uh, wonderful and informative uh, session. I also thankful to all the members who have joined us online and uh, other members. Uh, who are sitting with us in this uh, meeting room. And I especially appreciate and thank to my team, uh, Rumela, Samreen, Khawar, and other uh, members who have participated uh, in this uh, session and uh, who organized this session. I'm thankful all of uh, my team members and especially Dr. Lane, for uh, giving us this uh, informative uh, session.
Thank you very much. Uh, we will be uh, in contact with COPE if uh, any problem arises. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.